my name is Jana, and thanks Odemas and the whole FinTech Week crew for actually hosting, a, I think, uh, amazing event for the circumstances that we have. So, as you know, and as Odemas presented, um, today I'm talking about what are the trends, right? So I think everyone is citing the pandemic that has changed the world. But uh, for me, it's actually really interesting to look at that from FinTech perspective. I have been delivering this uh, speech, I think four months ago, at uh, Rocket Coworking, um, and the name was RVC is interested in fintechs in general. And uh, the room was completely packed. And I think at that time, uh, we didn't know uh, that what was actually in front of us and what was waiting. So today, uh, I have a little bit tweaked version of that. And the question is, and the one that I will try to answer to you, are investors still interested in fintech considering what has happened? Just a short disclaimer, I think for some who really studied the agenda, this was called as a workshop, uh, but uh, it is indeed uh, some of my content, and then we really, really expect you to be active on questions that we will try to answer together with Odemas at the end of the presentation. So, for those who don't really know um, or don't recognize this really super bright red color, just a very short uh, introduction of what uh, Startup Wise Guys is. So as I said, I'm a partner at Startup Wise Guys, which is a leading B2B accelerator and also an early stage investor. And we have been around for nine years, so I hope that uh, you will recognize this color from then on. And we have invested in almost 200 startups. And I think the best part of that, the most interesting for you, is that um, we invest in fintechs quite actively. It's almost one-fifth of our portfolio that is fintechs. That's why I feel myself quite uh, confident coming on this stage and talking about fintechs for you, which is not an easy crowd, right? So maybe to spoil it, yes, of course, we are interested in fintechs, right? So we as a startup wise guys, we, as I said, our portfolio has a number of well-proclaimed Lithuanian, Estonian, Latvian, Nordic, uh, fintechs as well, the ones from Turkey, so we can take a look at it. But I think the most interesting thing is for us to try to look so what the world thinks, right? Because if we invest and we support you in the journey, will there be anyone else in Europe or in the world that will be interested in funding you further? So when I was delivering this talk in February at Rocket, we were looking into amazing growth. So we can see that actually the overall trend is that with some dips and, um, and inclines, the investments in fintechs have been growing and we could steadily have been calling it like the next market. Everyone became very interested in it. Funds started specializing in fintech or so they said, as well as accelerators. And uh, it seemed like this is the area to be into. Everyone to be, wanted to be part of that. And uh, I think it's best uh, uh, portrayed by maybe this graph showing that almost every year, part of investments made into startups were actually doubling in terms for fintechs. So by 2018, 15% of all venture capital investment globally was invested in fintech. So that's actually a perfect trend. The question is, has it remained the same, right? So is the trend still going on? Can we expect it to double to maybe 30% this year? And I think TechCrunch put it very well, uh, even into, by the end of 2019, which hasn't been a long time ago, but it seems like ages because of what has happened. Uh, TechCrunch put it very well, another day, another monster VC round in FinTech, right? So this meant that all the challenger banks, uh, payment solutions, personal finance management applications, they have been nailing large rounds, and it seemed like the valuations were completely skyrocketing. So when we come to this age and we say, OK, there was the old normal and the very popular phrase right now, the new normal, the old normal we call the fintech fetishism. And this is what I just explained. So we are looking into companies with quite high valuations, with everyone wanting to be in the market, investors wanting to touch the fintechs and actually be part of that, whereas the new normal, we call it the fintech realism. Right. So the fintech realism is something that where we expect the companies to be a bit more down to earth, where valuations might dip 
where investments will not go skyrocketing high in, in the fintechs and the KPIs and the milestones for them will be a little bit different. And what do I mean by that? So we can take a look. So this is the slide that I wouldn't maybe be proud of, but this is, uh, you see the source. This is from a very proclaimed venture capital fund SoftBank, the quarterly reportings of Q1. And this is what they, how they saw the whole investment scene. So many, many unicorns running into the valley, dipping in valuations. Uh, and you should see the slides afterwards. So unicorns are all over the place. Uh, they're going either backwards or they're getting out of the valley. Is that true? If we look into the global investment trends, you could say yes. So this is the comparison and the very, very latest data from CB Insights on the fintech investments and how those look quarter by quarter in the past year. So if we look uh, in the current numbers, six billions invested in the first quarter, it looks like we will not be catching up of 2019 standards. But if we look a little bit closer, just in Europe, uh, you will see that actually it might be the case that all this fuss is for nothing. So quarter by quarter investments in fintechs in 2000, 2019 quarter four compared to 2020 quarter one has actually even increased. So it is important to look at the data and the real facts before we start all like drawing the, you know, the valleys of unicorns dipping. And uh, I think you have also followed quite big rounds happening lately for challenger banks, for example, as Revolut or even our own uh, very well-known startup transfer go claiming the round just now. So I hope you saw the news, it was out today. So it seems that there is nothing to worry about in Europe, right? We, are, we might be on track. Uh, one change that actually might uh, a little bit form the market and reshape it is where the deals are happening. So investors were really looking into investing into even early stage, believing the founders can take fintech from zero to a unicorn. Whereas now we see that uh, investments in the very earliest stages, serious uh, uh, seed and pre-seed stages, has actually declined quite a bit by almost 10%, giving space to bigger rounds like Series A and Series B. The reason might be many. The, those uh, deals might have been in the making. So as we saw, a lot of deals have happened because they were already on the table. The term sheets were on the table before the pandemic hit. And also, those rounds are usually follow-on rounds, right? So I've invested in fintech, they are doing very well, or they need more cash. Here we come to, to the rescue. In the seed and earlier stages, we understand that uh, uh, we invest into something completely new. And this is where some investments actually have stopped. So this is important to take into account. But also keep in mind that the, these are the global trends and they not necessarily prevail in our market, which I would consider Baltics and the Nordics. So in our market, I think the biggest difference is that we don't have a specifically fintech focused fund. But I would say that this might not be a problem because also it matters how you look at fintech. And I hope throughout all those four days here with Fintech Week, you will figure out that actually it's so, so much more than what we sometimes just say, challenger bank is a fintech and that's it. So we basically, what we look into as a fintech, it's anything from analytics to blockchain and all the payment solutions, insure tech, rec tech, prop tech, etc. So there are a number of, uh, number of areas that we call fintechs. And specializing in any of these verticals is actually <laughs> doomed uh, for failure if you do that in our smaller regions. I think you can only allow to do that when you are in a really, really big market. So just some data from 2019, we've seen that even though we had uh, big deals happening in mobility, fintech was still one of the most prevailing sectors raising financing in the Baltics. So. Um, I think TransferWise and now TransferGo, as I mentioned, this is really great news and we see the deals don't stop. So we had those deals in 2019 and the trends and I think the needs for the financing solutions that can happen without interaction, without <laughs> shaking hands or actually paying in cash, they are extremely important. 
So what we saw uh, in 2019 as the trends, we have been scouting for three years for fintechs, not only in the Baltics, we did that in Nordics, in Central Europe, we also went a little bit more to the east, and the trends are actually uh, differ here in our region. We might say that we have solutions that are a little bit more backwards com uh, compared to where US and, and uh, the Western Europe are. And we have developed many, many KYC solutions. We also, uh, we see that a very, uh, a lot of strong players in this area, but the problem for them now is actually to get out of that red ocean. So if you are a KYC startup, um, we are really interested to look at it, but I think the first question we will ask you is, how do you differ? And this is, you might say, it's a question that you always might get in any other startup, but I think this is extremely important in fintech space. Uh, then, of course, consumer lending, and I will talk about it, uh, about it a bit later, because we saw it as one of the emerging also trends and the winners in Q1 uh, of 2020. A lot of API integrations, B2C consumer apps for wealth management, for personal finance. And keep in mind, when I, I say that the, these are the trends in the region, I'm not talking about some uh, very well-established startups. So when we scout, we look also at the very early stage, and this is what we see. So if you are an early startup founder, you are entering, you want to enter the market with a B2C consumer app, you have to really evaluate well, how many people around me are also already doing this, right? Or how many people try to do that and what were the mistakes? We also seen quite a few cashback solutions, payment gateways, encryption and compliance startups. So this is what was, you know, around us in 2019. We have, uh, I would say, the trend was going a lot into technology sites, so um, really strong technological solutions. But the interesting part is who emerged as winners in the quarter one of 2020. And you would be surprised uh, that uh, when, let's say, we talk with uh, early stage startups and almost all of them, they have this big vision of a challenger bank. And I'm always like, oh, this is scary because this takes so much money, so much time, you need so much experience. Like, if you if you don't really like how one of the challenger banks work, you don't need to create your own because you will see that it's much, much more difficult. But what the pandemic and actually the changes in the economy uh, taught us, especially in the fintech space, is that the solutions that are required on the market are relatively basic. So it's a question how you approach them from the technical side, but if you look into the purpose of them, they are actually your day-to-day -day, uh, tasks that you have to do. So, for example, lending was, as I mentioned, was one of the areas that actually skyrocketed in terms of how many new startups were created, where venture capitalists were putting their money. It's for debt collection, for debt manage management, mortgage loans, emergency loans especially. So, I think if we look in our region, it might not be that visible if we look a little bit further, or even US. This was really booming, the number one category. Uh, then, of course, payments. They remained interesting for investors, but uh, mainly in e-commerce uh, e payments. And you can guess why, because so many businesses moved online. They are using the you know, fintech as a services. They're using the payment solutions existing there. So this was the time for those startups. Wealth management, especially, I think, uh, that very much uh, correlates to the health system in the country, but the health savings accounts were also quite popular a bit outside of our region. InsureTech, which uh, I will also mention that we are really lacking in our region. We really see that there is a lack of proper InsureTech solutions and uh, it can be attributed to many things. This was booming in some other regions, so cyber insurance, underwritings, employee insurance. And um, more and more, the more and more we go actually to remote work or the more <laughs> we come back, but let's not forget that the rest of the world is still in a bit different state these solutions will be particularly important to somehow provide perks for your employees that are not at the office anymore, right? Uh, regulatory tech, the reg tech, we've seen that a lot even in our Lithuania, right? Whereas uh, all the government meetings, they went online, municipality meetings, they went online. And then, you know, all those problems with uh, remote uh, collaboration tools emerged. Uh, so this is where 
a lot of rec tech solutions for compliance, for customer data privacy, digital identification, even biometrics in some sense, they came into place. So this is where actually before, when in the very f first few weeks, maybe some good hackers could go into a municipality or government meeting, uh, after a few weeks they actually had uh, those issues solved by relying on those solutions. So I think this is really interesting and we saw it in practice happening and uh, this is amazing that the, let's say, the, the sexy fintechs can actually fix, uh, fix uh, the public market that quickly. Uh, then, of course, uh, startups aiming at capital markets, so anything related to investment automation. I think so many people were bored, they started investing, they started looking into the trends of, that were super difficult to follow. So the Tesla is up and, you know, the Boeing is down. No, it's actually the vice versa. So all the capital markets related apps, investment automation, background checks as well, which relates a lot to QIC, uh, client onboarding and also behavior tracking, which we also have a couple of startups here, uh, these were the ones that actually see an increase in demand. So this was really, I think, interesting and it might prevail. So take a look at that. And all the fintechs related to SMBs or also SMEs, whatever you call it, anything on tax return management, trade transactions, cash flows, forecasting, um, and, uh, and the management of payments, uh, payments to employees, the perks to employees, this is really booming. And I was very happy to see that this market, which was somehow rolling, maybe a little bit slowly. Uh, this actually really uh, uh, accelerated uh, in the past few months because some companies saw they need a short-term solution. Some agreed, okay, this is the new normal. So we have to decide how we manage that and how do we act upon it. So what trends we will be following? And uh, you might think that, okay, now we just completely switch to what, uh, the slide that <laughs> I, I was talking about before and we just go after those startups. It is important to pay attention to, you know, what really works in our sector, in, in our region. And one of the key uh, still trend that we have been following and we still want to kind of commit uh, to it is investing in companies that use financial technology not necessarily as a uh, as a product or a primary primary business model, but actually as an ingredient. So it can be any uh, e-commerce uh, e-commerce tools. It can be any of the also PMF apps, etc. That not necessarily be uh, on the payment side, on the difficult uh, technological fintech infrastructure. We really uh, want to have more sustainable finance and uh, including, I think, the second point that I have here, the clean tech finance in our portfolios. And we hope that maybe we can push this trend a little bit to appear in the market. So this is something that's very in important in the other markets. I think here we still lack a little bit of it, but we see more and more people talking about it. A lot of support pouring in for those startups. So really, Taking a look at sustainable finance from both underserved regions, uh, uh, underserved populations, etc., this is something that still has a lot of space on the ground compared to some already trending solutions. Uh, one really interesting uh, and I think very easily uh, easy to grasp uh, category is uh, fintechs for kids and aging population. It is not, it's not necessarily something so groundbreaking. It can be the same challenger bank uh, directed at kids uh, or also some a applications for aging population that help for you to manage the pension your retirement money, etc. Uh, but this is uh, by seeing the increase in the number of that population and also the increasing wealth of some of part of that population, this could be really interesting. Uh, we really, as I said, we want more insure tech, out of home, health, workers, benefits, etc. Um, and we still see a bit of a lack of um, uh, activity there. And uh, I would say this is mainly because the players that could be providing the test bed for those startups, the big insurance companies, they are still not there in terms of engaging with startups. So for us, one of our missions is actually to activate uh, the ladder, to activate the bigger companies that they would tell, okay, this is what we are looking for and this is what we are looking for. And then I think the, the trend will follow. But 
this is really the space where I see that uh, many of the new startup founders could take a look. Uh, regulatory tech, audit, risk, compliance, as I said, this, is very, this was interesting and this will be really interesting considering how many cybersecurity issues we have noticed in the past few months. Uh, so this is the part where that we really want to support. And, of course, new models that might be serving the underbanked. We might not have a very prevalent, uh, prevailing uh, problem of that in our region, but this, uh, as we are focusing also on some other regions, this is one of the, the, the trends that's really growing and picking up. And another interesting uh, type of companies that we're looking into is the software companies bef uh, becoming fintech companies over time. So as I said, this is something where you use fintech embedded in your technology, but not necessarily work under regulations, the licensing, and other usually with fintech associated things. And when we will we'll be looking into those trends, I think it's also important to say, OK, so if there is a new normal, uh, does that mean that also those fintechs have to operate differently, not necessarily be in different categories? And I would say, in part, yes. So now we understand that the runways of 12 months might be, in most cases, not enough, especially for fintechs, because they require much more capital, and of course the sales cycles are much longer. So we are looking into improvements in speed of sales, but as well on technological, and also improvements of uh, in sa uh, sales cycle time and cost of that. So it does not necessarily mean that now everyone has to pick it up <laughs> and uh, start selling faster, because it does not really go directly to the startups themselves. But what we mean is that the whole models might need to be looked at. So the trend that I hear from the West is that okay, no more those big investments into unprofitable startups that have five years until they first make profit. And I, I think the investors are kind of really going down on that and they're saying, okay, now we want to see when do you make profit or when do you break even or any other KPI that would bring you a little bit closer to the reality. And if we talk about B2C, of course, uh, it's always important how many users you have, but definitely more interesting how many of them are paying customers, right? So how many, how many funded accounts do you have? And uh, how many of them are actually as a percentage of the downloads you have? So I've usually talked to startups about those so-called vanity metrics, whereas you present the metric that you feel proud of and you keep the rest aside. So in this case, uh, usually we hear, oh, you, you know, we have 500 users now at the first testing phase and then we have 20,000 users signed up. Um, well, show me the conversion numbers and then we can actually talk. So this is to take into account that I think the expectations for fintech startups, whereas they were I would say a little bit more loose compared to maybe the more basic SaaS startups. They're also now, the investors might be a bit stricter on, okay, so when actually we are, uh, we are getting out of the investment cycle and start making money. And I think the most interesting question that uh, uh, I would like to answer is, you know, why we are still in, why we are interested why we are still interested in this sector so of course if we look back in uh, in the last quarter the general trend is that it's quite stable fintech could have been used in many other let's say uh, uh, areas to improve our life and well-being in the time when we were all close and separated from each other but in general, I think, of course, this is the rapidly innovating sector, right? So thanks to our government and thanks to, you know, all the people working behind the fintech community, we have this great regulation that we can boost about. Uh, if we, you know, want to read it in understandable language, we can. We can really attract a lot of startups from abroad because of our regulation. So this sector, not from only technology side, but also from the efforts that the governments are putting in, that all the players are putting in, it's really innovating very rapidly. And I really think that it will continue to do so when we see the importance of it. Uh, Fintechs are also becoming embedded, so as I said, it does not 
take you to be a real fintech, to get a fintech license to be called a fintech. You can have it embedded in any other technologies, or if you are a fintech owner, a fintech startup, you should realize that your clients are not necessarily just banks, it's e-commerce shops, it's anything like, you can really look at it at a much, much broader sense from now on, because everyone understands that those pay like the payment solutions are particularly important. It does transcend through many markets, so uh, I think it can completely deny geographies, it can complete sectors, it can com uh, completely deny age groups. So there is not a limitation, whereas we wouldn't apply fintech to. And one of the key parts, I think, that we really like fintechs, and we see that trend going up, is that usually the fintechs are led by very mature teams or mature founders, and this is what really ticks. So this is what, what we are really looking into, and we believe that, okay, with a good team, you can make it, because it's not an easy sector at all. Uh, on the other hand, fintechs do require special attention. So once we uh, decided that, okay, we are going into this, we understood that we will need to tweak our offering a little bit. Why is that? It's, um, as I mentioned, we are happy to see good founders behind fintech teams, but so many startups are coming in uh, with founders having no relevant background. So as I said, if you are not happy maybe about some, I don't know, Revolut features, um, don't create another Revolut. Just really try to see, you know, what's the other thing that's, you know, not on the market, what's the other thing that you could improve maybe and sell it to, to the other fintechs as, as a feature rather than as the whole product. Uh, usually fintechs can be quite localized and that's mainly depending on the regulation. Uh, a lot of startups that are coming from uh, non-EU countries, uh, they are not well informed about the possibilities, I think, in EU and what we can do with the regulation that we have here. So usually we see that the fintechs are very localized and then they just cannot scale. As I said, we see too many big something. Uh, uh, I might be talking with a startup that's offering a very clear solution, for example, for making your payment via an SMS message, which could be a good feature. But then they say, OK, but in five years, we'll be this big challenger bank. So uh, this is where I'm always like, no, no, stop. Like Maybe we should focus on something a bit smaller. And think big is always good. But uh, we need to understand the requirement for this capital and what our region can actually offer. Uh, of course, as I said, sometimes the teams might have little understanding of the regulations and the boundaries that they have. This is particularly important anytime if you want to create something. Knowing the regulations can really help you to focus on something uh, much bigger on how can you use those regulations, how can you use the um, uh, rules of the market to make your startup better. On the other hand, if you don't know them, you might really struggle and just hit the wall at some point. Um, some startups might be operating on a fine line of compliance, basically uh, creating a solution and then understanding that they need a license for that. So this is particularly important. And one of the things that we really hope will go a bit down is the uh, valuations that were much steeper than compared to other markets. And uh, we, uh, we are now following the trends to really evaluate. So the fintechs that are coming to us, has anything changed? Uh, do the, are the founders more humble? Or actually, <laughs> we are continuing on a similar trend with quite high valuations. So uh, also, when we look not into the team, but when we start working with the fintechs, there are some um, challenges that uh, I think they still prevail. So of course, it's the business model, the lengthy B2B sales process, where, as I said, we have to look at it, can it be improved? Can the both sides maybe, if we work with the market or B2B or B2C, can we improve that part? Sometimes the exit potential uh, is not that clear. So how are we going to do that? Uh, are there many companies in the region that uh, can actually acquire you? Are there many investors who will be investing in fintech? Because this is also an important feature. Uh, usually investors can back down because they don't understand the technology. So you really need to find good investors that understand the technology behind it. Uh, some market players are quite passive in terms of testing fintech solutions. I think uh, we are really happy so far with the uh, 
uh, the improvement of how banking sector is uh, becoming more and more open for fintech solutions. But if we look, for example, on insurance market, this is not the trend that we see. So we really need to make it work a little bit better. And of course, the high capital requirement. This is something that probably will not change like this because of what has happened in 2020 quarter one. The sales cycles are longer, the teams are usually a bit more mature, the capital requirements are also usually associated with acquisition of the license. So this is one of the challenges and this is why it's important you know, to, to see if we in this region actually as investors can keep on investing in fintechs or we need to look at the bigger uh, funds. So what we at Startup Wise Guys, uh, as I said, we, deci uh, we decided that we need to improve a little bit the offering for fintechs so they feel that they have a longer runway. So we are looking at, uh, into the companies whereas we can invest from a smaller amount to take them to the next milestone. So it does not necessarily mean start making revenue, but it means that if you are really early stage product, we might invest in you 30 to 100,000 euros, but if then you hit that milestone, we can go into discussion about the bigger rounds. And we would really be happy to do that with other, uh, with other funds. And we see some of the funds really becoming more and more interested in fintechs here in the region. So to sum up, um, and I think to let you off uh, with a good note, so yes, VCs are interested in fintechs. And not too many things have changed, but uh, I think most important, pay attention to the trends that uh, this quarter, this time has brought to us. Uh, we might say, okay, it will, the history will repeat itself, or it might not. But uh, it just opened the eyes that the fintech is so much broader, so much more than difficult technical infrastructures, licensing, payment solutions, or personal finance management apps. So we can really see it in uh, many other applications, or you can create it as a feature to improve others. So this will be continuing, this will continue to grow. And uh, regardless of what we will experience in the next year or so, we see sustainable finance as a really major trend. So really, if we open the eyes to what is happening uh, a little bit outside the region, or even more to the Nordics, sustainable finance is now getting a lot of attraction and interest from VCs. So think about that. It will be, uh, become harder to distinguish of what is the real fintech and what is you know, a, f a software company with fintech features, and this is fine. Don't try to categorize yourself. Just look at what you're doing, look at the product that the market needs, and don't really try to you know, get into some specific uh, fintech, uh, uh, fintech category. Of course, very important to know the financial regulations, what is happening now in the market, the changes that are happening amongst like, the governments and you know, the, the, um, the regulations that are being changed. This is really uh, important for you to address because you can actually be the next big someone just really helping to, to solve a very small thing. And of course, be realistic. So, uh, uh, you know, when with the required capital and time, we understand that it will still take time to develop a fintech solution. Be ready for that. Commit for it full time, and then VCs will be definitely interested. Don't come up for like for it as a short fling. So. Just for the last slide, we are really looking for fintechs. I would be very, very glad to talk to you. I would be very glad to go into more detail of each of these features and maybe evaluate that for you. So just write my name at startupwiseguys.com and then we can discuss. Thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you can probably tell, the wise guys are a very inclusive bunch because they have sent the wisest girl to present and share her insights and ideas. Joanna, thank you very much thank for you. an enlightening presentation. Let's grab a seat and have a quick question-answer session. Um, we'll talk a little bit about your presentation. Uh, it was certainly very interesting to listen to it. And uh, I think I caught on a couple of things. First of all, I think you spoke to the global trends or European trends mostly, right? And I'm very yeah. curious to hear what do you think about Lithuanian trends or local trends? Yeah, um, I think um, 
um, as I said, uh, maybe some of the trends did not change that much from what we saw in 2019. So we see a lot of compliance, authentication, uh, startups, um, regulatory, some regulatory startups, uh, QIC for sure, uh, payments, uh, lending. So this continued. And um, I think this is okay because it hits the trend, uh, the trends uh, of the global scale. But um, uh, I think particularly who emerged were the startups that were providing uh, authentication and security solutions. So all cybersecurity startups are actually, uh, I think, they were the wa the winners. And uh, we hope this is a trend because this is important, um, and there is still space in it. So. So they can grab a seat. And pl plenty <laughs> of room, right, for everyone. Um, I think you also spoke a little bit to the, the kids and aging population. I myself currently don't have any children, but uh, I do spend quite a lot of time educating my parents on oh. how to use technology. And I'm sure uh, a lot of people... Uh, kind of encounter similar yeah. challenges, I think. But in addition to that, I think people also want their uh, children to be technology literate as in the, in the earliest age possible. So can you speak to, to that a little bit? It, are these products that are kind of focusing towards uh, the elderly or children, are these new products or are they kind of a spin-off of the same product? Um, that's a good qu question because um, I, I've mentioned just very briefly that I think a lot of current fintech solutions, they can be used uh, as a just retargeted to kids or aging population, but of course they have to have specific features like educational features. And I think that goes actually to both groups. So we need to educate our parents, our elderly, of uh, how to save, not uh, uh, under their bed or something, but actually have you know an application specific for that. The same is for kids. So I think the, their product is just much more related to gamification features and how we can actually make it interesting for them. Whereas I think on the elderly side, it, it has to do a lot of with security, that they feel secure, that they understand where they are putting the money, who is behind it. So um, this is an interesting trend. I know some of the banks are really focusing on the kids sector, whereas I think aging population is still a little bit, um, uh, let's say, behind it in our region because uh, it's not, uh, let's say, that wealthy yet, as we see in the West. So in the West, this is the biggest part of the population, and they're wealthy. So of course, they need those apps. In our region, uh, I think it will come with time, but uh, the kids, uh, I think, um, sector is something that's really interesting around. So we're likely to be the elderly population yeah, uh, well, <laughs> in the future, right? So they uh, really need to think of something very smart to teach us more about finance. Uh, on the other hand, we are quite literate as a generation, probably, yeah. in general, so it's not going to be that steep of a learning curve for no. us, right? Um, I have a couple of questions online as well. You talked about the, the lengthy B2B sales process. How can we shorten it? What uh, would be your recommendations? Oh, that's a <laughs> one billion dollar question. Yeah, just take out your crystal ball and give us. Yeah. Um, well, I think of course it comes uh, from one side. I think it's the cooperation that we are trying to uh, to push. So may, startups may not be able to do that, but we are trying to cooperate with banks, financial institutions to say, okay, uh, we need uh, those startups to to have sandbox. We need them to talk to your board, etc. So this is how we are actually trying to shorten it. And I think for startups that are. <coughs> maybe not engaged with investors or accelerators, this is really the value that they could get. Because usually alone, it's difficult to open those doors. Uh, but on the practical side, on sales side, we're looking into B2, the general B2B, let's say, tweaks and hacks of uh, uh, how can you sell faster. So I think, of course, you have to be super, let's say, security oriented, right? Uh, you cannot... Uh, come across as a real, real young startup. So we really have to, you know, kind of change the attire. And this might sound funny, but this is what we are going through with our startups right now. And also think of the B2B sales strategies, whereas you, you might be discounting the first year much more, or you're using them as pilot clients for a year, and then you only start charging. So there are some, but of course, uh, Every case might be different, but uh, it, it is improving. So yeah, you need to deep dive to be able to understand where exactly the delays happen, and it's a case exactly. by case kind of scenario. This is what, uh, yeah, exactly we do, we're looking where it doesn't convert, basically. Perfect. Keep the crystal ball on the table, because <laughs> uh, I have another one. So you spoke uh, a little bit about the investment trends, which seem to be 
quite contrarian to what the expectation probably was. Uh, people were kind of thinking that, yeah, well, the COVID crisis will definitely impact the economy, and as a result, investment will probably fall down in every sector, the fintech not being an exception. Why do you think uh, we're still seeing a fairly positive trend uh, from Q1 2020? And uh, is this going to continue? Yeah, uh, the crystal ball. <laughs> so uh, it is difficult to say maybe why some of the our views did not prevail. I, I think for us, if we look at the region, uh, the let's say the lockdown period, the oh my god, everything is going to change period was a bit too short. Uh, but I wouldn't discount that something will reappear in the future. We're not, not talking about the virus, but talking about the economic, probably maybe economic downturn, or maybe some startups running out of cash finally, and then really going into, into this <coughs> valley. Uh, but um, I think, of course, at the beginning there were so many speculations, and if we would have looked, I know, on the stock market, no one could have guessed what will happen tomorrow. So fintech is no exception, uh, but if we just look on uh, very generically, fintech was really needed to help. So fintech was needed in the economy to take all the offline businesses online, to take their offline payments online, etc. So this is where I think it really kind of uh, still remained very interesting for, for us. And I think probably uh, this was kind of, uh, I had a conversation with one of the participants in the conference yesterday as well, and it does seem that fintech to a certain extent actually in the crisis appeared at the right time and at the right place, right? And yeah. this is where this is a very good base to operate from because a lot of the fintechs are actually capable of uh, doing their business remotely. Yeah, exactly, of course. And, and they give that opportunity to, to others as well, so. Perfect. I have another question online. Uh, it says, great presentation, Joanna. I agree with that, absolutely. Uh, with so many fintech EMIs and payment providers in Lithuania and only legacy banking core providers, what is your view on the next-gen cloud-based modular banking core providers? And do you see uh, many of them in the region? Uh, very good question. And thanks for, <laughs> yeah, <it's probably laughs> thanks for the comment on my presentation. So... <coughs> to warm him, uh, warm me up but uh, no not too many in the region we see some and actually we see some uh, uh, very strong players emerging one by one in other markets that uh, the some of the com comparable ones I think one in Lithuania a couple you know in the Baltics across we could name those as startups uh, but why I don't think we are seeing the too many right now here is because uh, we are still very much focused on something very tangible, on something that uh, you know we see fintech, we can test it, and when it comes almost as a fintech as a service, for many uh, it, it is too hot to handle. <laughs> let's say. Um, Another question that I've got, uh, how can we reach out, well, there you go, there's, there's already interested parties. How can we reach out to Startup Wise Guys for co-investment opportunities as a VC? Okay, so uh, type my name, so it's J-O-N-E at startupwiseguys.com and then we can talk. Or, of course, the easiest way you can find some generic email on the website, uh, but definitely very happy to talk to you. Yeah, there you go. I think uh, it, it's a good uh, it's a good way to, to 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 network a little bit, even though you're talking only from the one side, where people are interacting and very interested. Uh, so please reach out to Yoni if you want to look for any kind of joint ventures. And uh, another question: What consolidation to, do you see happening in the fintech industry? Um, well, I think uh, in terms of consolidation, as I said. We see some fintechs becoming <coughs> embedded part of software startups. So whereas someone is uh, on e-commerce platform or on even looking more into the health sector, into the savings sector, here comes, let's say, the payment, the direct transfer startups. So not particularly in our region, I would say, but in others is where fintech is, is a feature rather than you know, a full payment solution. And I would really just, I think uh, it's a good trend to follow. Uh, perfect. And I think also in the in your presentation, you, you kind of focused on the positive side, obviously, uh, but uh, and you spoke to who kind of emerged as the winners. Can you speak to a little bit about who emerged as potential, well, not necessarily the losers, yeah. but somebody who may have had uh, issues because of this? 
Um, honestly, I have not, don't know, let's say, a name of the startup that I would say, oh, that, that's a particular loser or a specific, let's say, vertical or niche in this area. Even I think if we look on much broader sense in startups, those that we're talking about, you know, travel industry, they also did not become a loser. So there, there were not too many let's say, uh, uh, vertical specific ones, but of course, uh, on the technical and practical side, those who had very short runways, unfortunately, uh, it was, let's say, make it or break it moment for many, whereas uh, investors would have to choose, oh, okay, do I keep on funding you for probably at least another year or more, or this is where we kind of kill it. So just say goodbye, yeah. part ways. So long runways are very important. <laughs> yep. uh, what background is needed for team members working in fintech? Um, well, uh, I think, of course, the banking, uh, the banking industry, uh, let's say, breeds a lot of good uh, founders in fintech. So really understanding, uh, it, it could be on just economy side, on, on the regulation side, uh, but definitely I would see very strong founders and those who kind of graduated the bank school in a sense. So real understanding, how do you sell to corporate clients? How do you work with them? How do you appear? What do they need? How long the testing takes? Uh, this is really important. And of course the rest, the technical part, uh, it might not be that much different if you're not going after hardcore tech solutions. So as a matter of fact, we're saying that uh, banks are the kind of the breeding grounds for talent for fintech. Yeah. How do yeah. banks view that? Hmm. <laughs> well, we we actually we are kind of uh, generating some ideas how we could leverage more uh, bank workers to to create those fintech startups because they know what's happening, um, but. Um, I think in general, some banks are, are more, let's say, have more favorable conditions for that. They say go for two years, create something. Uh, but really, I think that the fact is that they see it as inevitable thing. So, uh, and I know from in inside, let's say, they will not be keeping you as like, oh, don't go. Uh, they understand that the next person might be coming, taking your place. That's okay. And this is the rotation that happens. But of course, something new they have to adapt to. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, this this kind of speaks well to uh, Chris Skinner's thought yesterday where he quoted Charles Darwin saying that basically the ones that are most uh, able to change or the most, uh, the most uh, uh, well, stress resistant when change happens are the ones that are going to survive this turmoil. Of course. Right? Of course. Um, uh, and uh, what areas of fintech do you think are already filled in and which, uh, which ones have huge capacity for expanding? Well, so more or less the whole presentation, um, just not to not to repeat it. Uh, as I said, I see a crowded market in personal finance management, which, on the other hand, still uh, has a lot of areas to improve. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, if you want to start it, you really have to understand how to sell it. This is usually the B two C, so particularly difficult in our region to roll that out. Uh, so this is one, as I mentioned, KYC really have to you have to think much much broader in terms of security rather than just a qyc solution so these are i think really pretty filled in in our particular region in the baltics but if we look on the other hand which are open insure tech sustainable finance and as i said maybe something oriented to other uh, other types of population, kids and, uh, and elderly, could be really mu something much more interesting. Okay, and uh, a final question, uh, just kind of uh, slid towards it uh, in my earlier question, because that was a good follow-up when uh, somebody was trying to already establish context with you. Uh, could you speak to a little bit on how you guys operate? Is a more kind of proactive or a reactive approach in the sense of how fintechs approach you or whether you approach fintechs? Yeah. Um, well, I might say 50-50, but of course we do both. So we are waiting for startups, of course, to, to reach out to us, but we know it will not <laughs> ever happen if we don't put a lot of effort. So we do, of course, the general scouting where we look for early stage startups. We used to travel uh, the whole region and now we can't, we do that online. Uh, uh, so uh, this is how we really, we try to organize events, talk one-on-one -on -one with the startups, organize the best FinTech mentors we have. Uh, but it also comes a lot from personal connections, from me reaching out to you and saying, maybe you know this one good fintech, just one good fintech, nothing more, uh, that you think we should talk to. And we are always happy to talk without, um, let's say, 
definitely putting money on the table, but maybe just helping to improve something in the startup and say maybe it's not a good fit for us, but uh, we can recommend you some someone else who would be. Which is also a great thing, right? You just uh, you give the people the opportunity to introduce to a person or a, a fund that is more interested in that type of yeah, area, exactly. right? So uh, that's perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, I have Yone Vitulevichute with me here in the studio. Uh, it has been a pleasure listening to your Thank presentation you. and also a pleasure talking to you. Thank, Thank you, you very much one more time, Yone. And I think all the audience watching us online is sending you their love <laughs> and, uh, and wishes. And I think uh, in our previous panel, Nick uh, used the remaining 20 seconds for a Christmas wish. Do you have a Christmas wish? Oh, <laughs> of course, I want uh, those who are listening really take into account the kind of uh, filled in niches and use something that we, as I said, it was a hint, we're really ready to invest into. So we're really ready to talk and try not to predict too much what will happen. Uh, take it as it is right now. We think w the, the f on the fintech side, we see that we're quite stable and we hope uh, it will remain so. Perfect. And my Christmas wish for you is that you can, can return to flying as the oh, lockdown is lifted. For sure. <laughs> you spent too much time at home probably yes. in the recent <laughs> days. Thank you very much, ladies Thank and gentlemen. Uh, we have Yone, and it's a pleasure. Fintech Week, Lithuania.